Hi, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we will talk about the soft X-ray spectroscopy uh, in the battery studies, and I will focus on the soft X-ray rigs. But before we touch rigs, we have to chat a bit about the X-ray absorption. That's how this talk is put together in the three parts. And uh, I will first chat about several things we sort of have a deep dive into the problems of the batteries. And then we will look at two individual cases of one is on an anode on transition metal state and the other is on cathode on the oxygen state. That's how the three parts over here in the middle will stop for questions, which is typical uh, for the seminar series uh, Jerry organized. So if we look at, oops, Okay, so to, this is always a fun part. Uh, even if you don't work on batteries, I'm sure you have seen a lot and more and more news on battery these days. Uh, often it's not good news. It's all like uh, cars catching fires, boat catching fires, airplane catching fires, cell phone catching fires and all those. So, so it's, a, it's a funny question. Um, why it's so hard to control the battery or to improve the battery. If you are holding a battery, either rechargeable or just primary battery, not rechargeable battery in hand, it looks so simple because all you see is that there are two electrodes. It's a positive electrode and negative electrode. And for the rechargeable, or if we talk about lithium ion battery, we feel we more or less understand it in the way that the lithium ion going within the battery back and forth and the electron going through the outside circuit through either the charger or the application you want to use it for. That's how the, the battery, rechargeable battery works in a very simple way to understand this. And one thing I want to mention here is lithium ion always goes together with the electron. If the lithium ion goes into the cathode or positive electrode, the electron will also come here, meaning this will be reduced. The, uh, the other way, uh, the electrode will be oxidized. But in reality, if we look at what's really in a battery, in a battery in reality, what we will see is it's way more complicated than what we see, just two electrodes here. If we just dive into the electrode itself, only the electrode, and uh, I will touch only a little bit on electrolyte and interface, which is, which is, uh, which is a factor that took in history a lot more time in the development of the first generation batteries in reality. So the interface and electrolyte takes much more, much longer time to develop in today's battery reality. But if we look at only the electrode, the electrode itself has multiple components. The material that we have been talking about in most scientific literatures is only part of the so-called active material. This is a material to have the lithium in and out. Besides these, there are many other components, different additives and binders to bind it together. So the electrode, is a mechanically and electronically integrated unit with multiple compounds. And each component deserves studies to improve. And to have a, a, to have a further dive into what happened in the battery and how you get the voltage out, and you have to narrow it down further into just one of the active material in the electrode. And that gave us some basic idea on where we get the uh, voltage out in battery. So over here, I'm plotting just, you can grab this online everywhere almost. It's a first generation battery system with the graphite on the anode part and with the lithium cobalt oxide of the cathode part. So what happened is if a battery is completely discharged, the electrochemical potential of these two will come together. There's zero voltage when it's completely discharged. When you charge it, 
what happened is the lithium ion coming out from lithium cobalt oxide. The lithium ion will come out and then get into the anode. So it's from the cathode to the anode. That's a charging. And outside is a charger, of course. During this charging process, what you will have is the electrochemical potential when it's charging goes off the lithium cobalt oxide on the cathode goes up. And then the potential of the carbon-based anode goes down. That's how you open up this voltage. So in theory, a battery like this could give you a very high voltage, more than five volts, and give you a very high capacity. But in reality, this kind of battery could give you only half of the capacity and much lower uh, or on the voltage. And the reason is there's always detrimental phenomena happening when you go to a high capacity and high voltage cycling over here. So this gives you a general, I hope it gives you a general idea on uh, when we chat about battery electrode, we are really talking about a tip of this iceberg. And as I mentioned, many other factors from the engineering packaging, from the so-called inactive compound current collector even, took some time to develop and also the interface. So, and this complicate the battery in its performance parameters. And this is a, also a well-known so-called reader chart of the performance of batteries. If you look at the performance parameter of a battery, it has a safety lifetime, specific capacity and energy density and many factors. Unfortunately, if you try to optimize one of the performance parameter, for example, the NCM is a relatively uh, uh, more, more equally optimized in you know, all those parameters. But if you want to drag any of those to the desired performance, like if you want to improve the energy density, or if you want to improve the overall output power or the stability, and every time when you try to just drag this little better, you will lead to a disaster to another per performance parameter. So that's how the optimization of the battery and the control of it is so difficult. Even if we only look at one piece of the component in the battery and not talking about in reality, there are a lot of components in, uh, just in electrolyte. There could be more than 10 additives sometimes to optimize the uh, interface and various performance. So this is a complex system. And the question for us or for this audience, for our community is, of course, what could we do with spectroscopy on such a complex system? So. So if we look at what soft X-ray spectroscopy could do, and we can very naively define a couple questions that we could try to answer. One is, of course, I explained when the lithium goes in and out, the electron goes in and out. So the material, the active material of the electrode goes through this, this reduction when uh, electron comes in or oxidation process. In battery language, it's called redox process. And the other thing is if we uh, look at different electrode or different process, the diffusion of the lithium is more on the structure determining factor because the lithium ion is an ion with atomic core, and but the electrons is just the electron. So the electron redox reaction is more on the electronic structure. So that's why the high X-ray has been used a lot in the battery studies, especially on the structural studies. And soft X-ray, of course, is a more sensitive tool for many elements on the electronic state or chemical reaction probe. The other thing I just mentioned very briefly, I'll give you a very quick example uh, later, is on especially the anode part, the surface or interface formation is critical. Actually, without a proper interface formation, there will be no battery today at all. And soft X-ray, with those chemical and elemental sensitivity, we can, of course, touch the topic on what is the reaction mechanism 
in the electrode. And we can also have the surface sensitivity through the soft X-ray spectroscopy. I think this audience knows very well. Soft X one of the features of soft X-ray is on surface sensitivity. And there are many other probes that I, I will not touch today, but I will touch mostly on the redox chemistry today. So the typical uh, or the conventional X-ray absorption spectroscopy has been employed in battery research for many years, and it becomes more and more popular on the soft X-ray. It's still less popular than hard X-ray, but uh, it is getting more and more popular. I'm just popping up a summary of several transition metal L edges, soft X-ray absorption. If you look at the manganese, iron, nickel, those 3D transition metal, the L edge line shape, because the L edge corresponds to the excitation of the core electron excited directly to the valence 3D state. So your sensitivity of the valence state is very high because you are really looking at the configuration of the unoccupied 3D configuration. It's directly in the valence band. So that's how if you measure the LH of all those transition metals, you will see an obvious change on the total line shape. And for example, iron, you will see if it's a purely iron 2 plus, you will see a very uh, different line shape here comparing with uh, uh, iron 3 plus oxidation state over here. Because of this sensitivity, you see all those dotted lines here is what we can do through a very simple linear combination. You just need to linear combine the line shape of the different transition metal oxidation state, the spectral you get, and you can do a very precise fitting to get the oxidation state uh, distribution in the battery electrode at different voltages. And obviously they are changing. That means the redox reaction happens to the manganese here, to the iron here, and also uh, whether it's nickel or manganese, you can buy, you can measure the LH to determine. So this, this becomes a very handy tool. I understand for the spectroscopy community here, we sometimes may feel boring. This is like well known, but in the battery study, this becomes very powerful because it gives you an elemental sensitive probe on what redox reaction on which transition metal uh, element it happens in the battery and at what state in different stage of the voltage. You, you can do a very careful and quantitative analysis. So the other funny thing also, we typically talk about uh, quantum factors like spin state uh, in languages of fundamental physics. So, but in battery electrode, if the configuration of the transition metal is different, for example, in this so-called Prussian blue type of material, a transition metal could be coordinated with either nitrogen or carbon. This leads to the very different scale of the crystal field. And that the different scale of the crystal field, of course, leads to the different spin state. It could be high spin or low spin. And this fundamental physics concept actually determines how easy or how hard it is to introduce one extra electron in here. That is a redox process. When I say lithium goes in and out, electron has to go in and out. So obviously in this configuration, the low spin configuration is much easier to introduce an extra uh, electron coming in. And that corresponds to the discharge of this cathode material. It means it's a high potential. And for the other case, of course, if you introduce an extra electron into this high spin state, we all know it introduces a so-called onside Coulomb interaction. Uh, it introduces an extra energy you need to, you need to spend to introduce it. So it's much harder. So it's harder to discharge. It corresponds to the lower chemical potential. And this could be absorbed in spectroscopy by having a much lower energy in a state in the X-ray absorption spectroscopy and it corresponds to the higher potential. And that's why with the same redox, with, with the same elements taking place, with the redox reaction taking place, you could have two different voltages. It, it sounds a bit, uh, 
it sounds a bit surprising, but if you look at the spectroscopy verified the spin state picture, everything could be so clearly uh, interpreted. So, and on the interface, I just want to quickly introduce one thing that is on exactly the same type of anode with the surface termination of 100 or 001, in the spectroscopy, you can see how different those spectra is, the red one and the blue one. They are taking on the surface signal of the same King electrode, but just different surface termination. And what turns out is uh, uh, the surface interface formation, one is through the decomposition of the salt, the other is through the decomposition of the solvent. This kind of information, I would say it's very hard to obtain the because the whole cell, the overall cell is done with exactly the same electrolyte and salt, the system. The only change is the surface, but spectroscopy tells you a clear contrast of this. So the, I, I think I touched uh, several quick examples and I touched the topic on what we want to see through the spectroscopy, the redox reaction, uh, the interface surface. Th those are the topic that I will chat about today, especially the redox reaction. So I, I would like to just pause over here uh, to see if there's any specific question on the problem that we try to tackle or why we want to spend a synchrotron uh, technique to, to study a similar device uh, a similarly simple device of battery uh, over here. There's a few uh, a question or two. Um, first, what would you say is the overall status of theory for these L-edge transitions? And where is either progress being made or needs to be made uh, to oh. uh, in support of battery work? Yeah, so I would say uh, the theory on the transition metal L is very good at this point. So there are, uh, the LH is mostly multiplate based calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not very expensive. Uh, and there are uh, new, uh, there the, the have been three packages uh, building on the popular packages, building on the multiplate code. And I know different groups, uh, some groups, they develop their own multiplate calculation code. So the reason is the uh, LH spectroscopy is defined by very localized state. So the 3D transition metal, uh, the 3D state is very localized. So you can often uh, do the calculation based on relatively like an atomic model type of the multiplet. That's how uh, the theoretical calculation is, I would say it's very good. Uh, even sometimes quantitative comparison with theory uh, is good. So on the K edge, however, is another story though, yeah. Okay. All right, very good, you should continue, thank you. Okay, so let's get to the rigs now. <laughs> so the, this question is asked also because uh, we have been mostly running on X-ray absorption also because it's convenient and it's fast comparing with rigs, I mean. Uh, uh, for some of you, if you're not uh, running much rigs, I do have a slide a bit later to explain quickly what is rigs. So, and the question is, the batteries we have been used before, we're not satisfied. We want to drive a car for much further away. We want to have a car that could accelerate much faster. And we want to have a grid based on solar and wind that could have a storage reservoir be charged and discharged very fast. So we're asking more and more from the battery. That requires the battery to be operated at a range that is not done before, particularly at the high voltage range. When you think of the castle, the picture I showed before, you go to a higher and higher voltage. I said the lithium cobalt oxide, it triggers all different detrimental effects. It's the same thing here. And Fundamentally, when you drive an electrode into very high voltage or very high capacity range, you will drive the system into a highly oxidized, for anode is highly reduced state. And the question is, could the XAS always work to probe 
those chemical state when you drive when you drive the system into an unconventional range. So this is one example to work with the South Bay startup company, uh, Natural Energy. So uh, Colin is actually the CEO of that company. We met each other during a conference. And so they found a material, a very interesting material, uh, also a so-called Prussian blue material with a transition metal, uh, sorry, with a transition metal surrounded by uh, the CH group the, with the affinity of either carbon or nitrogen. So his, this material works by delivering a very low potential, meaning it could be used as a good anode and it's very low cost. The puzzle is the transition metal in this material, they are all magnets. And the original material of the, the pristine material, once they formed, it is magnets two plus already. So now if you reduce the magnets two plus, what when we talk about magnets, we typically talk about zero and then two. So if you oxidize a metallic magnets, you oxidize it to two plus, right? So it's it's zero or it's two. But we know if we reduce the magnets two plus to metallic magnets, this will not be very reversible. It actually goes to the conversion regime of the electrode. They will uh, accumulate and form metallic nanoparticles typically and all those. But this material, they do cycle pretty well. And that's also the question we try to answer with X-ray absorption if we take the spectra of a charged and discharged electrode, they really show more or less the same line shape. And I will I will show a bit later, there is actually a difference over here, but it's just so negligible in the X-ray absorption spectra. And the carbon and nitrogen, this carbon nitrogen group is very stable in this. It's hard to imagine the redox reaction happens to that, but we do measure the carbon and nitrogen. And the redox seems to be happening really just on magnets to some magic state that we couldn't see through the X-ray absorption spectrum. So that also, that's also the time uh, we rebuilt our whole experimental system uh, back in 2016 to drive towards the so-called high efficiency uh, RIGS mapping. So uh, let's chat a bit about what is really RIGS technically. I know many of us in this audience are familiar with RIGS, uh, but I still want to go very quickly through this because it, it has the information on why the RIGS has so much improved chemical sensitivity here. So if we look at the X-ray absorption spectra, what we measure in the conventional XAS is actually not X-ray absorption, except you run like stick some type of transmission mode, you measure the absorption. What we are detecting is really the decay after its absorption. If the decay shows up as an electron coming out or the photon coming out, that gives us the electron yield and fluorescence yield. But anyway, if we have the instant photon energy at every point, we count the decay process of the released photons or the released electrons, we get the 1D spectrum of the X-ray absorption, meaning at every excitation energy, we have the total counts of how many photons or how many electrons comes out. We do not care if there is a difference on the photons coming out. We only count the total number here. That's what we get the X-ray absorption. And now if we go through all those different excitation energy and we stop at every excitation energy and try to pull out what are the different photons coming out? You get a emission energy distribution curve at a each excitation energy and you plot it onto a color scale of color. So this is two thirds of the spectra I already removed. It's already hard to read. So that's why typically we plot it in a RIGS map. You get this uh, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering map over here. So uh, when I say, I want to quickly go through this, this, always tells us 
the rigs provide us with a completely new dimension of information. That is uh, information of distribution along emission energy. So now we do the same thing with these two electrodes of this anode material on the magnets. So I just rotate 90 degrees so I can display the, uh, the, the, the Riggs map clearly here. So these are the same X-ray absorption spectra I showed before. As I mentioned, there may be some difference over here. So if you extend this through a Riggs map along the emission energy, this new dimension of information, you will see the contrast showing up immediately. You can see if you discharge or charge, the discharge has two uh, lines over here going parallel. This is an elastic line. I, I, I don't think I need to explain this for this audience. And if you charge it, the overall pattern change dramatically and it give you a very clear contrast between the two. So just on the finding itself, this already shows the risk mapping gives us a much, much more improved chemical sensitivity because of this extra emission energy. So the interpretation turns out to be pretty straightforward because uh, we know in this energy range, this kind of uh, energy loss feature, they correspond to the DD excitation. It's the occupied 3D electron to the unoccupied 3D. And when you have a magnes 2, uh, magnes 2 plus valence state, you will have, if we, uh, I'm just talking about the low spin state over here. The, the reason there are little other is there is a high spin magnets uh, state over in this material. If we look at the low spin state, if you have magnets two plus, you will have one extra unoccupied state in the T2G. So your excitation of the D2D could be the excitation from the occupied T2G electron to the unoccupied T2G relatively low energy DD excitation and also T2G to EG relatively high energy excitation. But if you have a magnet one plus, all your T2G is fully occupied, that push majority of the DD to the relatively high energy uh, to the DD excitation from T2G to EG. So that gives you the overall change on the Riggs pattern when you charge it, because this is anode, when you charge, you reduce it. You are reducing the magnets from two plus to one plus. So the simulation related with the question we chat about before, the calculation of the transition metal L, even on the rigs, uh, is pretty good. So this is a calculation done by Professor Andrew Ray at NYU, New York University. Uh, it could reproduce the experimental data pretty well. And as I mentioned, the explanation the, this finding actually indicates the existence of the magnets one plus, and we, when we look into the literature uh, postdoc, uh, there was a 1928 paper uh, written in, uh, in German uh, talking about there is a possibility of magnets one plus exist uh, in this kind of material. And now you can see why this was never really clarified or found before. So uh, this is a transition metal case, and this is also a case for the anode on the reduction. So before I dive into the oxygen, great. So before I dive into the oxygen, that may take a little more time. Uh, I would like to pause another time here uh, to see if there's any question uh, on this anode magnet state uh, that could be seen by rigs, but not much seen by X-ray absorption. Um, we have a question from uh, Yulia. Ah, hello, uh, very nice talk. Um, I have here a question, uh, whether you try to look at uh, manganese K beta X-ray emission spectroscopy. It's hard, hard uh -huh. X-rays, because I'm very intrigued by this manganese plus state. I would be very interested to measure, or maybe you already measured it. Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. You are asking whether we did the K edge rigs? A K beta rigs. Oh, no, K beta X ray emission. Of course, you can also do rigs, yes. Mm -hmm. the, sorry, I, I still. Uh, okay, so you excite above the manganese K edge? 
So hard X-rays, yeah? We're talking hard X-rays. Uh, this is a soft X-ray LH. You excite the 2P core, core electron to the 3D. I think the question is, do you know if um, K-edge emission spectroscopy has been done on the same system? Oh, oh, uh, not on this particular system, sorry. Not on this particular system, but there are many K-edge studies uh, on the transition metal uh, in both the absorption and the rigs and X-ray emission. I think in Argonne, there is a high throughput X-ray emission system developed uh, to, to run those K-edge X-ray emission. The, the reason we had l edges uh, is not only limited because uh, the beamline I'm working at <laughs> runs with soft X-ray, it's because of the reason I mentioned before, the l edge is a direct excitation into the valence 3D state. So it is much more sensitive. If you look at the absorption of the K edge, what you will see is the edge shifting and the edge change because the majority of the high intensity signal is the P state, the excitation to the P state, not directly the D state. And the D state shows up uh, in the very low intensity in the so-called quadrupole excitation there. So, that's why we, uh, we, we determined the L edge is a much more direct probe uh, or comparing with the K edge if we talk about especially manganese. And I think Ira and Nico, they are uh, uh, much better in K edge. Manganese sometimes is very troublesome uh, in K edge. So, yeah, uh, so my group uh, and in collaboration with Jerry Seidler, we do. We do this type of spectroscopy and we do it on the protein, but also on some model compounds. So mm -hmm. I do have an interest to obtain a manganese class spectrum, you know, oh, yeah, just for sure. the curiosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, uh, if you shoot me an email, I can just connect you directly. I don't need to be the middleman here. I can connect you directly to the, uh, to, to directly the company. It's an industry level material, very high uh, quality material mm -hmm. uh, with calling. Uh, if you are interested to run some tests, I'm sure they will be happy to provide the material. The only tricky thing I should mention is, uh, I know some that the, the hard X-ray is very convenient to run. You don't even need the ultra high vacuum and all those. So the Magnes One Plus uh, material is very unstable. I have to say. you have to try to avoid any air exposure. Uh, Things like glow back type of thing will not work. You, you will need to have a, a sealing or transferring seal it very well in the high purity argon and all the, because you can imagine the magnets one plus uh, any exposure to the air will oxidize it uh, to the magnets two plus. So the, just be careful with some material handling. The, but you can definitely shoot me an email uh, and we'll, I could connect you to the material. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be very interesting to know what uh, the different signatures of the manganese one plus would be in the hard X-ray spectroscopy. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have a, a kind of a related question here, which is uh, beam damage. I mean, manganese is notorious mm -hmm. for photo reducing. Mm -hmm. Um, do, you, uh, do you ever run into issues with that, with the soft x-rays, with uh, the hard x-rays? I can turn MnO2 into MnO, I mean, instantly. Um, uh, how much of a problem is it with the, uh, with the soft x-rays? Yeah, very good point. So I don't have it in, in this talk. We actually spend a large amount of time trying to figure out the radiation damage, especially in soft x-ray. Uh, you, you know, Jerry, the soft X-ray radiation damage issue is much more serious comparing with the hard X-ray, <coughs> mostly because the energy <coughs> is all limited to this very shallow range. So uh, that's exactly one of the reasons uh, we developed the very high efficiency rig system. So when we developed that system, what we had in mind is we could compromise even some of the resolution for studying those uh, chemical sensitivity. Uh, let me see whether I have a slide. It's, it's okay, it's okay. So, I think, uh, <laughs> I know you have a, oh. a hard cutoff at 10 o'clock today and I so, don't wanna, yeah, I don't wanna I risk that. To, yeah. <laughs> so the, I'm saying uh, we developed this very high efficiency uh, rig system 
So we could, this is, a, this is a 10 second spectral and all those edges coming up. If you look at the background and the mm -hmm. peaks, it's extremely high throughput. And the other thing is we can run the experiment with very high uh, speed. The other thing is we also developed a whole sample manipulation system. When we run the battery material these days, we actually keep moving our material, constantly moving mm -hmm. under this. And because of the high efficiency, uh, the, the flux, the instant flux, uh, we can control for running rigs is much lower than uh, what you have to do with the other rig system. So we actually just had a paper on GPCL uh, showing up a month ago on the, uh, on the radiation damage uh, to okay. study a transition metal oxide. So yeah, yeah, it, yeah that's absolutely a relevant question for any of those studies. Uh, but there are ways, uh, especially through the detection efficiency improvement to ensemble manipulation. And uh, we didn't see much change when we cool it down, though. That's I very see. different from okay. biology systems. Yeah. yeah. So the, yeah. That's, uh, uh, that, that, that is uh, one factor that we have to play with all the time. Yeah. Very good. You're back to the right presentation screen. You should continue. This is a fascinating talk. Okay, so let's chat a bit about, okay, uh, I'll spend 10 minutes on this. Let's chat a bit uh, about the oxygen uh, in, in the battery system. And I will be talking about only the cathode and only the transition metal oxide in this talk here. So uh, I have shown this figure twice already. I want to pop it back up out because the question is always related with this high energy, high uh, voltage cycling. When you uh, run a battery uh, into the high voltage domain, you actually highly oxidize a transition metal oxide system. And the question rises on, are you oxidizing the transition metal or you are really oxidizing the oxygen? And the oxygen being oxidized in today's battery is always a disaster because you oxidize oxygen, either generating peroxide or oxygen gas, and the electrolyte, in today's electrolyte, they are all highly flammable. And considering you are injecting oxygen into a highly flammable system, that's what the disaster comes out. And of course, most of the catching fire thing I mentioned at the beginning, they are mostly because of the either the mechanical shortening or there, is, there are things uh, grow inside the battery to shorten the two electrode. So anyway, in this high voltage regime, we really want to know what happened on what element. So if we look at the uh, transition metal is still, again, it's relatively uh, easier to address because uh, we can measure uh, sometimes hard X-ray K edge is a convenient and fast experiment and sometimes L edges. So on the oxygen, however, is another story. If we look at the reference compounds of the oxygen, we can see more or less, we can figure it out with just a conventional X-ray absorption. If we look at the peroxide and carbonate oxide, uh, they seem to show a pretty obvious difference on the line shape. So seemingly, this could be done with the X-ray absorption, right? Uh, but when we work with the X-ray absorption, we quickly realized there is a fatal problem in here because the system are always oxygen or always transition metals surrounded by oxygen. The oxygen is always coordinated very closely with the transition metal. And this is a, this is a, what I would call a killing experimental result here because all the battery researchers, they know lithium iron phosphate, there is no oxygen activity involved at all. Nothing uh, related with oxygen. It's a purely iron redox reaction system. And not only us, we had a couple papers and many other groups has confirmed this is a system without oxygen involved. But if we look at uh, this energy range, exactly this energy range of the lithium iron phosphate, if you oxidize this material, when you pull the lithium out, you charge this you will see a dramatic contrast, a very strong peak start to evolve when you charge this electrode, when you oxidize this electrode. This contrast uh, 
from all the electrode we measure turns out to be the strongest in all those cathode material. But ironically, it is a material without any oxygen redox involved. So that already tells us something is not that straightforward by looking at the X-ray absorption. So uh, for again, for this audience and for this spectroscopy community, many of us are aware of the fact that in this energy range, it is exactly the energy range in X-ray absorption, what we call pre-edge range. And the pre-edge of the oxygen K absorption is dominated by the transition metal character because they always highly covalent to the oxygen. It's a hybridization state that shows up in the oxygen K spectrum. And if we look at different configurations of the transition metal or your charge and these charges, you can see all kinds of changes, but you can simulate and you can also fit this pre-edge change, all different kinds of change, almost purely based on transition metal changes. So the oxidized oxygen feature, unfortunately fall into this same energy range but because of the signal is dominated by a transition metal character. Now, if you want to watch the oxidized oxygen in transition metal oxide, although individually reference, or if you look at transition metal, they're all okay. But if you want to combine the two using this to claim that, it becomes a problem because your oxygen oxidized oxygen signal is buried in this very strong transition metal character. So this becomes again a question on chemical sensitivity. Can we somehow distinguish the oxidized oxygen feature from this very strong transition metal character? And again, this, this is a very nice topic uh, we can try with the RIGS mapping because as I showed previously in the Magnus one plus case, if you extend the signal along a new dimension called emission energy on what is the energy of the outgoing photon, you get a new dimension of information, you are able to extract the single digit data into a spectra. And this is how you extract this 1G spectra into a 2D RIGS map, right? So. And we can see from the, this is a typical lithium, so-called lithium rich compound technical detail, I'll, I'll just skip. Uh, but just look at the spectroscopic result. What you will see is in the X-ray absorption, you see these two peaks I mentioned is dominated by the transition metal 3D hybridized to oxygen. So they show up. And in the X-ray absorption, sometimes uh, you will see a little filling up here. Seems like something that sometimes you just see a valley between the two peaks, but in the RIGS map, you see clearly a well-defined feature start to show up if you measure this oxygen K RIGS map. And to determine this is relevant to the oxygen redox, to another bunch of effort, uh, as you could imagine. So, but uh, relatively straightforward, we can see this kind of feature start to show up in the peroxide species. And we can see that in another kind of oxidized oxygen in the oxygen gas. And what is interesting is if we look at a highly covalent CO2 system, like the CO2 is a highly covalent molecule, the oxygen is not really well defined as oxygen 2 minus. They, they, it's very hard to define the valence in CO2, I would say. But in this, along the same energy range, there is nothing. It's actually below, it's totally background. There, there is nothing shows up. So the RIGS somehow is able to pick up the intrinsically oxidized oxygen state, but not to, to have this kind of signal in a highly hybridized state of the oxygen. And that gives, gives us the chance to really separate out the hybridized species with the intrinsically oxidized oxygen. And now we could uh, focus on this little feature uh, in a battery compound. And what is, uh, what is very, how, how do I, uh, how should I say? We, we were very excited uh, when we see this kind of thing emerging. 
So what we did over here is we watch the intensity of this feature, how they grow when you charge, when you go charge and discharge. The features start to emerge around here, and then they keep growing in the intensity here. And then when you discharge, the features start to fade out slowly until to some point it completely disappears. And if we watch the intensity change of this going up and then down of this feature corresponding to the capacity change in the electrochemical test, the uh, horizontal axis is the capacity uh, of the battery electrode. We measure by just accumulating the current uh, when we charge and discharge. So they have a very well consistency in here. So the, this serves as, a, a, I would say, a very good demonstration. The feature reviewed in the RIGS map, it does provide us a fairly reliable tool to characterize the emergence of oxygen redox. And if you look at the feature showing up and going back, you can characterize how reversible this reaction is. Uh, you go to the charge, discharge, charge, discharge, 100 cycles, like in this particular material, this material, uh, it shows up pretty well uh, reversible in this system. So uh, I would not, this is a very uh, long story actually on the oxygen redox and it's still going on with a lot of fights and uh, arguments in here. Uh, but uh, as a lecture today, I hope it gives you another clear demonstration, the RIGS map. Uh, in some specific cases, it could provide you a much improved chemical sensitivity that is in dire need uh, by the battery community to look at those, uh, especially the high voltage cycling or very, very much reduced or very much oxidized system. Uh, so with that, I would conclude my talk with a quick summary. So first, I do want to emphasize, I'm not saying anything bad on X-ray absorption. We were still running this. Uh, X-ray absorption is still very powerful uh, to and very convenient to measure a lot of things. That's partially the reason I do want to go through several quick examples on the X-ray absorption. Uh, but in the meantime, when we drive the battery system, into a very high voltage range, we are facing the question, um, if we do not see this kind of thing in extra absorption, uh, do we really do not have a reaction or is just the tool is not sensitive enough to see that? So that's the focus I've talked about uh, on the transition metal and on the oxygen state. And uh, we could also, uh, we also have the feeling these days on many other questions uh, in battery topic like the solvation shells uh, and also some interface system. Those are all the topics that is very hard to tackle with just X-ray absorption, but we see the hints uh, that the RIGS experiments uh, could help a lot on distinguishing those uh, either very weak features or, or, or a limited amount of the source of the signal in, in this kind of cases. So with that, I will finish my talk here and see whether there are more questions. <laughs> Very good. There's definitely questions. Um, to begin, Maria Chan. Hi, Wanli. Uh, Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, so we know that in some of the systems, um, you see oxygen evolution. So right before that, there should be um, a, a superoxide species. Um, do you think you can catch that with rakes? Uh, yeah, so Maria, a great question. I, uh, I skipped a lot of technical details here. So I should mention first, when I say this is a nice demonstration is because this system, the oxidized oxygen, they happened always in the material, all through this reversible oxidized oxygen. That's how you get a very good match of the spectroscopic signal change comparing with the capacity. In many other material, as Maria just mentioned, like this lithium rich material, there are uh, roughly two different kinds, I could say very naively to categorize that, two different kinds of oxidization of oxygen. 
One is this kind of reversible oxidized oxygen within the bulk lattice of the material that hopefully we could make use of that. The other type is you oxidize the oxygen and the oxygen get released, uh, either trigger surface reaction or just release as oxygen gas coming out. So for RIGS technique itself, I would say no, we cannot, to answer Maria's question directly, we cannot catch the other type of the oxidized oxygen with the oxygen release because all our experiments were running within the ultra high vacuum environment when they uh, when they release out uh, even if they are close especially close to the surface area they are trapped they mostly escaped and there are papers showing up from last year on the so-called trap oxygen that's a, another topic uh, so but when we look at the signature in the uh, in the rigs, what we are chatting about is a non-release uh, oxygen getting oxidized in this material over here. To measure the released uh, species, we typically approach uh, in two ways. One is we do the dams, uh, the institute dams, uh, to watch the to use a mass spectrometer to watch the gas release from the material. And then using soft X-ray spectroscopy, we watch the surface species forming because they almost always trigger a surface reaction. Well, uh, it's funny, we just have a paper showing up today. Uh, it just got online, I got a notice when I woke up today uh, in Jura. Uh, so the, on the surface reaction, we can use soft X-ray spectroscopy, look at the surface that indicates some surface reaction uh, showing up there, so, but not in this rig signature. Mm. Very good, thank you. Um, Elmar Kateev, you have a question? Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, my, yes, my question will be about the Piranda measurements. So some of the intermediate species and phases in the battery, they sometimes cannot be isolated for ex situ studies. Yeah. So my question is, is it possible to perform rigs in a Piranda? I mean, during the charge or discharge of the battery with this brand new mm -hmm. Uh, approach of using silicon nitride in order to separate UHV of the analysis chamber from vapor pressure of the electrolyte? Yes, so uh, great question. And I'm not sure, I think Jinghua is in the audience. Uh, that's great. So a uh, direct answer is yes. So today we could run various kind of in-situ experiments using silicon nitride window. But that really deserves another one hour talk. And Jinghua and his group has pioneered and developed various kinds of soft X-ray institute tests, uh, including those electrochemical cells with voltages supplying on and those. Uh, That's an excellent meantime, idea. You've just mention... nominated, you've just nominated Jinghua. I like that. That's an excellent <laughs> idea. Yeah, I, I think I saw him in the audience in the night. So see, uh, in, in the meantime, I also want to mention the soft x-ray in situ or operando experiment, uh, they are typically a complex setup and especially for marrying the oxygen. Uh, so if, let me see whether I have a quick, so the, oh, not here. So the, uh, the, the oxygen or carbon type of signal, they unfortunately, they just come from everywhere. Uh, including the cell itself and the electrolyte. And so you will be picking up, you know, in situ setup, you will be picking up not only the signal from the material, the active material here you want to measure, you will be picking up the signal from all different components, you know, in situ cell for some particular uh, elements, especially carbon and oxygen. But for transition metal is much more straightforward there. I would say, uh, it, we have seen a lot of achievements on the Institute soft X-ray uh, spectroscopy rates and X-ray absorption on Institute studies. And it is still a field that is advancing uh, and there are new opportunities, especially on solid state batteries that naturally make this situation much better to use soft X-ray to run that. So and it's case by case on what element or what kind of system. Uh, but yes, the, there are, uh, develop systems uh, in, in, in the soft X-ray uh, community. Mm -hmm. Very good. Just following a, a comment, Wally actually had a Obrando uh, 
uh, Rick's study mm -hmm. on the solid state battery. That's a paper on that. So yeah, Jin Hua is here, great. <laughs> All right. Um, I know that the speaker has a 10 o'clock meeting that he uh, uh, he really needs to attend. So I'm going to thank everyone for coming and for your questions.